Okay. Uh, the California Police Chiefs Association. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Joe Sawyer and honorable members of the committee. <clears throat> Once again, David uh, Bejarano, President of the California Police Chiefs Association and Chief of Police for the City of Chula Vista, just south of uh, San Diego. <clears throat> it's important to note that these grants uh, require a collaborative, all-inclusive uh, approach. And I believe that's reflected since uh, Mr. Smith is sitting right next to me. And as mentioned, we are currently serving together on the Executive Steering Committee responsible for these grants. Starting with the 15-16 budget, uh, this legislator created an opportunity to really enhance existing efforts that encourage jurisdictions to cultivate new approaches to strengthen relationships between law enforcement and communities they serve. Uh, we all are aware of the, the change in the policing environment over the last 18 months to two years. And in talking to a lot of chiefs throughout the state over the last year during my tenure as uh, president of the association, we do have over 330 chiefs in the state. It's probably the most critical issue that uh, chiefs are concerned about and have a vision to really improve and enhance uh, that relationship between community and law enforcement be successful. Uh, as mentioned also, the establishment of this grant program mirrors recent efforts at the uh, President's level with the uh, uh, Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Uh, Mr. Smith mentioned all the critical pillars that we're trying to address uh, through the grant funding. Uh, and once again, it's intended to fund a collaborative law enforcement community approach, and it does require a formal partnership with a community-based uh, organization, including direct funding uh, for that partnership. Law enforcement applicants are encouraged to develop an overall project that incorporates the principles that we mentioned from the uh, 21st Century Policing Report and also really encourage innovation and creativity in the partnership. The applying law enforcement agency must partner with organizations, as we mentioned, uh, with the community they serve, and the goal is to have multiple perspectives involved in the planning, development, and implementation of each proposal. <laughs> Further, the uh, partnerships between the agencies and non-law enforcement groups <clears throat> must be formalized via formal letters of agreement, a formal partnership. And as mentioned, as the um, co-chair of the Executive Steering Committee, we developed the R RFP. Uh, in the near future, we'll be reviewing all of the applications. And once again, in communication with a lot of chiefs throughout the state, uh, they're looking forward. We anticipate we're going to have, obviously, a lot of applications and the limit of funding. And uh, they're all looking forward to the opportunity to seek some of the funding. Uh, the only concern or maybe complaint from chiefs throughout the, uh, the state is because it is a priority, an urgent need in our community, uh, the need for additional funding. Based on my former position as the uh, chief of police for the city of San Diego, currently in Chula Vista, uh, where we really practice and we're seeing nationwide as a model for community policing, it works. Uh, you can't be successful in policing without that critical uh, police community uh, relationship. Uh, so once again, uh, we encourage you to support uh, the additional funding uh, for this year and hopefully increase it to $12 million to really have an impact uh, based on the size of our state, the number of police departments throughout the, uh, the state, <coughs> and obviously this being a critical issue for both law enforcement and community. Thank you. Thank you. And now the uh, Department of Finance. Lizzie Perrin, Department of Finance. Um, <clears throat> I have no additional comments at this time other than the administration is in support of improving interactions amongst law enforcement and the communities they serve and the um, proposed funding. Thank you. Uh, LAO? Uh, we do have a couple of comments about this uh, proposal. Uh, first, I just wanted to note a couple of quick things uh, uh, for background. Um, the first is that providing police services is a uh, a primary function of, of local government. Um, in, we, we estimate that cities spend about uh, $10 billion annually providing police services. Uh, the vast majority of that funding comes from local sources, uh, such as tax, local taxes and fees. Uh, as part of the 2012-13 budget, the, uh, the, there was a temporary three-year grant program established to provide some funding for law enforcement. Um, it was initially set at $24 million per year. Uh, in the second year, that grew to $27.5 million. And then in the third year, that grew to $40 million in 2014-15. In the 2015-16 Budget Act, the, uh, the governor proposed and the legislature approved a temporary one-year 
uh, um, extension of those law enforcement grants uh, at a reduced level of $26 million and provided uh, a little bit more um, uh, specificity in terms of how those funds would be expended. So that includes this uh, six million dollars re um, related to this program that we're discussing as part of this issue, as well as twenty million dollars that relates to uh, a separate grant program that we'll be discussing later in your agenda. The uh, we we do have a couple of concerns with this proposal, and uh, we we raised a couple of these issues in our recent report. Um, in particular, we did raise a concern that the program uh, really lacked clearly defined outcome measures uh, to, that would be needed to evaluate that program. Um, however, I would note that since we issued that, um, that report, the BSCC has put out an RFP, and it does require the evaluation uh, of, the, uh, of the grant recipients to evaluate the impact of the, the grant. So we, we're definitely encouraged by that. Um, however, we still are concerned that it seems uh, a bit premature, uh, given that those grants haven't been allocated yet, and the state hasn't had a chance to evaluate whether, in fact, those grants are achieving the intended outcomes. Uh, we think it's a bit premature to um, uh, allocate more money for this program at this time. Uh, the second concern we have uh, is just that, the, as I noted, the uh, policing is primarily a local responsibility um, and that the proposed funding here really is just a tiny fraction of the total amount that's spent on local policing. Um, so it really raises the question of uh, what this, what's the state's role in sort of intervening in this way and providing this, this funding. Um, so given these concerns, we are uh, recommending the legislature not approve the grants at this time. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ernie? Questions from? <laughs> yes, that's Ms. Um, Campos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You talked about that um, you didn't see that there was clear um, outcome measures in, in your analysis. Do you have some suggestions on what they should be um, measuring as the money is allocated at, in moving forward? Or is it just your opinion that... Um, there's not sufficient um, data to be able to agree to move forward on this. So I, I think that uh, the BSEC really did in, in address our concern in terms of the uh, defining the outcome measures and setting up the ability to evaluate the programs because in the RFP that came out since we issued that recommendation, they set a requirement that any grant recipients provide a plan for how to evaluate the outcomes of, of the program. It doesn't specify exactly what those outcomes are, um, so I think it'll be left up to uh, the grant recipients in order to define what, what success is in terms of strengthening community relations. Uh, there, uh, we think there is probably a way to do that and to assess that, um, and we think that the, the steps that BSEC has taken in the RFP are, are, are encouraging an appropriate step to set that up. So in your opinion, or the department's opinion, um, you agree that they have outlined uh, sufficient ways to evaluate it. it is that is that clear? I, I think it's uh, they've done what they need to at this point, and in set of, terms of setting up the requirement in the RFP, um, the actual evaluation will have to be done by the grant recipients once they receive the okay. grant. I guess where I'm um, not understanding your statement is that you're not recommending that um, we move forward on the grants right now. And I think that's where I'm not understanding. Oh, from. If uh, they're so doing I, everything that they need to do. I, I, so, uh, yeah, if I could just clarify on that. I please. think the, our point is that we think it's premature to allocate additional funds, given that the first round of $6 million that was uh, appropriate in 2015-16 hasn't actually been awarded yet. Um, and let alone having a chance to evaluate the impacts of that $6 million. Um, so it, it, it makes sense, in our view, to allow those funds to be distributed um, so that we can sort of evaluate the outcomes and then determine whether additional funding, this additional $6 million, for example, is justified. But in your opinion, you do believe that, they're, that we're moving forward in the right direction? I think that the BSCC has taken appropriate steps in ensuring that the outcomes uh, can be measured, yes. Okay, that's what I wanted to understand. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. And, and, I, and I think, too, 
as we move forward, especially if, um, and we'll have public comment after this, um, I think this, this, this committee, um, if you're successful, Chief, uh, your 330 chiefs are successful at, um, you know, reducing racial profiling, um, racial bias, and, 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 and just really helping with the whole Black Lives Matter problem with this money, which is where I think you're trying to get to, which I think the ACLU is really concerned about. Um, and I think even the LAO would say if you're very successful at it, um, I don't know if the Department of Finance would give me $330 million. <laughs> but I do believe if the state, and a lot of my colleagues are talking about or putting in laws for, for racial profiling, putting in black lives, we're, we're doing all these mandates and regulations. A lot of it's unfunded. And so in some ways, the state may have some not liability, but we do have, we have to put some skin in the game. And so um, we're going to hold this over. Uh, because we do believe we need to have some some oversight to ensure that you get you you meet your goals or that whatever the the RFPs when they come back um, what the LEO is is saying which is really valid how do we how do we the legislature know that this has actually been done and and how um, successful it's been and obviously if it's very successful we need to to keep moving on and doing more of this. And, and so we're going to hold it over so that we, we get some more specificity on, on what your RFP is doing and, and we have some ways to measure it. Because I think it's really important that we show some success, especially from, from the chiefs, because it starts from the top and it goes down. Okay. Sure. Um, uh, I come from the city of San Jose, a very large city, and I've seen both sides. I served 10 years there. I saw what... Uh, partnering with uh, community-based organizations and community policing and representing an area where you, at one time, the community feared um, uh, working with the police where we implemented a chief a long time well, before I was an elected, worked with him on a project. I don't know if you know Captain Ortega, who, yes, wonderful, you know, worked with him on his uh, vision um, in community policing and officers being able to work with communities of color and getting that trust um, where you actually start having communities of color feel that the police are someone that they can talk to. Um, because whether you're a community of color or no a community of non-color, uh, at the end of the day, you want to know that you are in a safe place and that you can pick up the phone and call your police and know that they are going to be able to serve you. So I'm a, a, a big advocate for community-based organizations and community policing. And so I want to make sure that as we're moving forward that we're looking at these grants. And, and I hear um, the... the uh, spokesman uh, for ACLU. I, I'm not sure if six million is sufficient. Twelve million may be the number, and and I would like to be able to move towards that because I am a big advocate of making sure that we can have both entities work together for the healthy, um, for the well-being and uh, of our communities as we move forward. Uh, people always ask me. Why are you such a big advocate uh, on these two issues? Sometimes they clash. At the end of the day, when you have, you know, brown on brown in our communities not feeling safe, um, there's something we have to do. And if this is a program that's going to work, then I think we need to figure out how we make it work. Mm, thank you. Um, any public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, Sean Rundle with the California Peace Officers Association. Our membership is about 3,000 law enforcement officers across California. So on uh, behalf of the law enforcement family in the state, I also advocate for uh, what's proposed, but possibly more, uh, as Ms. Campos alluded to. This $6 million is kind of a drop in the bucket, but a lot of the agencies, a number of agencies in California are chomping at the bit to try and uh, participate in 
these programs. One of those is a number of departments, including San Jose, that participated in the California DOJ's uh, principled policing on procedural justice and implicit bias. And CPOA, a number of our agencies are working with DOJ, who has offered to kind of train the trainer, a number of our agencies to put trainings in their local uh, departments to increase community relations. So it's a, certainly an important issue and one that all law enforcement agencies across California are taking um, very seriously. And we know that this, this funding, because the framework that's set in place through the RFP in this process, uh, we perceive to be very beneficial. So we, uh, we ask you to uh, consider these funds. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Hi, my name is Robert Copeland. I live here in Sacramento, and I think any uh, funding should go to uh, how to police get along with the public. Because I don't think uh, police should be protect and serve, not brutalize and harass the public like they do here in Sacramento. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members. Corey Sazillo here on behalf of the California State Sheriff's Association in support of the budget proposal. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Chair, members, Roxanne Miller representing the Mayor, City Council, City of San Jose. Uh, we are pleased today to come forward and this early hearing to indicate our substantial support. We appreciate what the board has been doing to listen carefully to LAO's concerns. Uh, we think this is uh, on the right path, obviously, we'd like to see as much funding as possible for the safety of our community and the well-being of a public safety in our community. We look forward to working with this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine Clay, a mental health advocate and a consumer. One of the things that I didn't hear um, talked about was the education and being able to work with the police department on the training to deal with consumers of mental health. And I think that that's one of the things, the big issues that need to be addressed, that the police department needs to have more training how to deal with consumers that receive mental health services. Thank you. And with that, we're going to hold this over, get more information. Thank you very much for testifying today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, issue number three, the $250 million to general fund for jail construction proposal. The Board of State and Community Corrections, Corey Salzillo, Legislative Director, California State Sheriff's Association. Lizzie Buchan, uh, State Advocacy and Communication Director, California United for Responsible Budget, Department <coughs> of Finance, LAO's Office, and Public Comment. Oh. And we'll begin with the BSCC on the $250 million for counties. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Katie Howard again with the BSCC. Um, it, the primary uh, spokesperson for the administration will be the Department of Finance on this one. Oh. But I just wanted to offer um, information, additional information from what is in your analysis today. We have all kinds of information that you may be interested in about the various um, new kinds of beds that have gone into recent jail funding proposals. Um, overall, the net beds that came through the last round of funding that this legislature approved, which was $500 million in 2014 under SB 1863, statewide that net bed count was 372 beds. So you had big counties in their proposals um, proposing to take down, in some cases, over 400 beds and then build the focused um, programming and treatment space. So I just wanted to be sure that if there's additional information that's helpful to you on what's being built in the recent jail proposals, we're happy to provide that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Corey Salzillo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for having us here today on the panel. Um, just wanted to continue talking about this. We've talked about this before. We've talked in your office. We've talked in this committee room about prior efforts um, to uh, make funds available for counties uh, to replace and renovate their jail facilities. Um, and this is the next logical step, to give counties a chance to pursue the appropriate facilities to successfully achieve their new mission. Um, jails have a new mission in a post-realignment and post-Prop 47 world. Facilities are old and unsafe. You know me, I'm not, um, uh, let's just say I walk through these facilities and I get heartbroken, okay? It's not, It's this is not a partisan issue. This is not a, 
uh, it, it's a it's a human being issue. We walk through these facilities, and we know they need upgrading and fixing. Um, we need to have the space. They lack adequate treatment, rehabilitation, mental health, and medical care space, and that's what we're here to talk about today. As I said, this is a human being issue. To provide that treatment uh, and program, we have to have the right space. This is not about more beds. This is not about more jails. This is about better beds and better space that reflects the reality of today, which is that jails are holding inmates for longer periods of time simply because of realignment and because of Prop 47. That's the realities of what we face. Um, what Ms. Howard said, um, the the LAO chart that's in your in your packet shows that uh, over 10,000 beds are planned through the three prior rounds of funding. Um, but in combination w with Ms. Howard said, SB 1022, the round before SB 863, only created about 700 net beds. The vast majority of the new beds from the three funding programs are attributable to AB 900, and the AB 900 intent was more beds, particularly in phase two of AB 900. That was designed to address particularly the counties who were releasing large numbers of inmates early because of overpopulation. So I just think it's important to kind of show that it's not just, you know, we're not just adding thousands and thousands of beds for bed's sake, that there was a reason for AB 900 and that the last two rounds, SB 1022 and SB 863, have been largely focused on, again, that treatment space, program space. We can talk about funding for programs. We can talk about funding for educational opportunities, but the but the reality is until we have the space to provide those services, then it's just talk. We can't do this in a hallway. We can't provide mental health services through the bars of a cell. Um, sheriffs want to provide all of these things, the education, uh, the mental health services, but until they have the space to do it, it, it really is an academic exercise. Um, the SB 863 beds are special use, medical, mental health, reentry, competency restoration. Um, if you want examples, Humboldt County's 44 new beds. It's a 38-bed community transitional reentry inmate housing unit and a six-bed mental health treatment unit. The Sonoma program has 40 competency restoration beds and 32 seriously mentally ill inmate beds. Alameda is building a mental health program service unit and it renovates existing housing for a net decrease of 18 beds. Santa Clara's program replaces almost 800 currently dilapidated beds. It, it's a net increase of 18 beds, but it provides for program treatment, medical, and mental health space. These are crucial programs that need funding. And what we're talking about today are the 20 counties who have not been successful or who have been unable or unwilling to apply for funding in the past. Um, the LAO's point um, about an analysis of the need, the need is clear. In SB 1022, there were $1.3 billion worth of applications for $500 million available in funding. For SB 863 last time around, there were $1.2 billion in applications for another $500 million. So for between a billion dollars of availability, there were $2.5 billion worth of applications. Counties provide a match. They're doing what they can, but we're looking at one system now. We have a system that's together. State and local has to work together. The state's been very generous in helping counties with their responsibilities and their needs in, per in terms of pursuing the facilities that are required. Prop 47, um, our populations have dipped, but they're coming back. Um, the first quarter numbers for 2015, population was down about 9,000 inmates overall statewide. That number's coming back up, and we suspect that number will continue to rise uh, as people either spend more time for their sentences because they're not, others are not being released early, um, or other folks come back because of failure to appear warrants or things like that. Um, and even if the population stays low, it doesn't change the fact that the facilities are deficient and that we don't have the space. Um, counties are getting sued just like the state has. The state hopefully will soon be out of the, the thrust of the litigation. Um, counties are next. The same attorneys who have sued the state are suing the counties. More will join that unfortunate fraternity of parties who have faced this litigation because of insufficient facilities. And, and, and that's what we're really talking about here today. We're talking about inmate safety, the opportunity for inmate rehabilitation, officer safety, and overall better outcomes in public safety. So we thank you for, for hearing this issue again. Uh, we urge your support, and thank you. Thank you. Lizzie um, Pucci yeah. from CURB. Yes, thank you.
Good afternoon, Lizzie Buchan, Californians United for a Responsible Budget, um, and I urge you to reject the proposed $250 million for jail construction. Uh, California counties have a critical opportunity to significantly and sustainably reduce the number of people imprisoned in their jails. Model alternatives to incarceration are finding success across the state and the nation, including pretrial release, diversion programs, and highly effective community-based programs for people with mental health um, and substance use treatment needs. Since Prop 47 was implemented in 2014, jail populations are down by nearly 10,000. Um, we have an opportunity not only to reduce the number of people in our prisons and jails, but also to invest in communities that have experienced high incarceration rates uh, to make those communities safer, stronger, and more prosperous. But many California counties have been unwilling to seize this opportunity and to implement reforms that would safely reduce jail populations and allow people to return to their families and their communities. And the state of California, instead of incentivizing these promising reforms, it reforms is enabling counties to reinforce their reliance on incarceration by funding the construction of new jails and the expansion of old ones. Since the peak of California's unconstitutional levels of prison crowding implementation of realignment, California has authorized $2.2 billion in lease revenue bonds to finance county jail construction. As a result, there are more than 40 counties attempting to build new jails. These counties are currently in the process of adding 14,000 new jail beds. Uh, the governor's proposal for yet another $250 million for jail construction, bringing the total to $2.5 billion, is wasteful, unnecessary, and will ultimately harm communities that have been most impacted by crime and incarceration. I know we'll be hearing from the LAO, um, and you've all read their analysis, so I won't go into details, but I want to emphasize their analysis finds there has been no adequate assessment of needs for programming or capacity, and no evaluation of whether counties have pursued alternatives to jail construction. Um, the fact that that more that lots of counties are trying to get money is not a statement of jail programming needs. As far as alternatives to jail construction are concerned, there are many options the county counties and the states could pursue. Counties have the capability of reducing their uh, jail populations through sentencing decisions, probation practices, pretrial release. The state legislature can influence jail populations by changing sentencing laws, providing investments in alternatives. At both the state and the county level, policymakers can sustainably support public safety and community well-being and address the root causes of incarceration by investing in community-based programs and services and strengthening the social safety net. There are more effective, more humane, and cheaper alternatives to jail for people who are pretrial, for people with mental illness, for people who are victims of abuse, and for people who are homeless. And these options need to be fully evaluated before any jail expansion moves forward. Um, we are familiar with the arguments for, for new jails. Um, they argue that they need to build new, better jails to improve the housing, the programming, services, treatment um, they provide to the people that they imprison. Um, I think we really need to be talking about the housing, programming, services, treatment in our communities, um, which would be denied $250 million in supportive investments if you move forward with funding these jails. We also need to ask ourselves basic questions about who is being jailed and what they're being jailed for. Uh, according to the BSCC, in June 2015, more than 46,000 people, or 63% of the people in our jails, are pretrial, and that figure is actually a little higher in the counties that are would be eligible for this for these funds. Um, they are predominantly people who are poor, people of color, uh, people with mental health issues, and uh, again, data from the BSCC for June 2014. June 2015, show there were more than 16,000 mental cases open um, that month, um, more than a fifth of the people in our jails, with 13,000 people receiving psychotropic medication. There are clearly urgent, unmet health, mental health needs in our communities, and many people with these needs end up in jail, where they are locked in, an, in a traumatic environment and face long wait lists for treatment programs over and under medication, the reliance on solitary confinement for suicide prevention, and deputies untrained in mental health crises. Um, and, and I would just note that several of the lawsuits face it that county jails are, are fighting right now are not around the quality of the infrastructure. They're around the treatment that they're receiving from sheriff's deputies and from mental health uh, treatment staff. Um, acknowledging these failures, uh, we have heard arguments that more money and newer facilities will help sheriffs improve their care of people with mental illness. This is a misguided rationale for costly and unnecessary jail construction that siphon funds from community-based alternatives. 
there are community-based programs that have demonstrated success in helping people with serious mental illness, including those with a history of arrest and incarceration. Uh, and these community-based programs not only come at a fraction of the price but are than jail construction, but are also far more humane and have far better outcomes in reducing recidivism, reducing incarceration, um, and improving mental health. Choosing to build jails that ostensibly focus on mental health treatment leads us down a path where people who are poor can only receive treatment if they are arrested and incarcerated um, and ineffective treatment at that. This is already the reality in too many low-income communities of color in California, and we need to start repairing the harm that this reliance on incarceration has caused. The governor declared when he proposed his budget that he didn't want to make any permanent changes. Uh, what is more permanent than building jails? Spending this money on jail construction will cripple our state for a very long time. Uh, we, we just need to look at what happened with the prison system. You're all familiar with the numbers. The population's gone down by 46,000 and the corrections costs have increased. These high costs will persist until we start closing prisons and reversing the prison buildup that this state undertook for several decades and is continuing to this day. Uh, we are now repeating history at the county level, engaging in a massive jail buildup. This is a very long-term commitment to staffing, to operations, to building maintenance, and most importantly, to imprisoning people, primarily from low-income communities of color, uh, instead of looking for alternatives and instead of building economic and social opportunity in these communities. The people who are currently imprisoned in our jails and whose children and grandchildren would be imprisoned in the jails that this proposal would build if it was um, allowed to move forward uh, come disproportionately from neighborhoods that are overwhelmingly black, Latino, and poor and that suffer from high rates of unemployment, poverty, homelessness, and lack of basic services. Uh, these are the same neighborhoods to, pe to which people return when they leave uh, jail and prison. More jail construction does not address any of... Yeah, okay. I'm wrapping up. Uh, more jail construction does not address any of these problems. It only makes them more severe and spreads them across more generations. Rather than institutionalize our massive incarceration rates for many decades to come and accelerating the downward mobility of low-income communities of color, we urge you to use the $250 million towards making these communities safer, stronger, and more prosperous. And I have submitted a letter that includes a list of alternative investments on behalf of CURB member of, and allies. It includes the strong California budget uh, proposal from the Assembly Select Committee on Boys and Men of Color. Um, includes repealing maximum family grant rule, reinstating COLA for CalWORKs and SSI, um, and a list of other uh, alternative investments that are urgently needed in our communities, and, um, and I'm happy to go into more detail about any of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.